it's your girl Q Shy Town here with another installment of the A List Alert coming on behalf of the Key S Expressions Publishing slash Multimedia Division. We are doing big things in the Midwest, you guys. If you are new to the channel, welcome aboard. Go below this video, hit that notification bell. That way you know when I do new uploads. If you are a returning viewer, thank you so much. You're part of the 194,000K views, both in the US as well as overseas, you guys. It's another rendition of Shock Value. Like and subscribe on like, share, and subscribe on everything that you're seeing today. I need you guys commenting, liking everything. Get the likes up. Let me know your feedback on the topics on the videos. Comment for me. Get the project in the algorithm so YouTube knows that I'm providing value. Okay, so what do I want to say? I want to say happy birthday. Happy birthday to Dottie Stacks. She is in the building and she plays no games. Today is her birthday. Go out there and support her arena of entertainment. I want to say congratulations. Congratulations to Trina. She is a new wife as well. Go out there. And guess who's on the remix? On the A-List Alert remix is none other than Christopher Williams. Yes, we got to talk about that. Now, everybody knows about Diddy. Everybody knows the Jaguar right has been the source of information. But she got that particular information wrong. So allegedly, she did an interview with uh, Jean Deal. Both of them were sitting on the couch together. And what ended up happening was the topic of Christop Christopher Williams came up and Jaguar Wright really tried to play it off like the information was it wasn't incorrect. You know, she sat up here for months bashing this actor, this act, this uh, entertainer. And basically, I know he probably lost money. He probably lost endorsements all because she said that he was in the room with Diddy, allegedly. But Gene Deal, on the other hand, in this interview said, hey, hold up. It wasn't Christopher Williams that was in the room with Diddy. It was another young man that was in the room with Diddy. He said, yeah, I had to correct you because I know Christopher Williams, you know, personally. So allegedly she was, she owes him an apology for what he said, but she's not going to give it to him because he called her a crackhead. <laughs> Well, who could blame you? Who could blame him for doing that? You go on social media for months and you bash him and he's been the person allegedly in the room with Diddy that you have come to identify based on your sources. And you have just basically ruined this man's reputation. He's trying to come out with music and he's getting pushed back 150 feet because of what you're saying about his career. And then to come up with Gene Deal that says, hey, look, I can vouch for Christopher Williams and his personality and his the fact that he's a gangster. Come on, you have you can't just brush that off over the table. So that hurts your credibility all across the board. So go out there, support everybody's arena entertainment. We're going to stay glued to find out exactly what's going on with that. What I ended up wanting to do with this video is a part two, because I previously talked about in the first video uh, the Wayne's legacy and dynasty, and that starts with Keenan, but also Marlon. Now, Marlon, as you know, uh, he came out with his stand-up comedy called Good Grief, and I was able to review it and gave you guys some pointers on the previous video about what I liked about it. Now, I also went through, and because he came from In Living Color, I wanted to figure out like what was Keenan Ivy Wayne's mindset about the show, and then also let you guys know, even though his time there was short, on the show, he went from 1992 uh, to 93, performing, I thought it was a lot longer. And then he branched out into the uh, WB network with all of his shows. So um, the Wayne's brothers had a spinoff. They did their own show with uh, Witherspoon, John Witherspoon, the late great John Witherspoon, uh, rest in peace. Uh, they did that, the whole dad and the sons, and they're going through their whole slapstick comedy with that. And it was a really funny show as well in that. So I found an article that is, that was very interesting about the legacy of In Living Color. Because again, like I said in the previous video, the monumental effect that In Living Color had on that decade, I was 10 years old. No, I'm sorry, I was 14 years old. And a lot of that material... I couldn't sit through because it, I was underage. But you had a whole circle on Fox that really tried to push the envelope. Well, you got to understand, in TV, they were up against HBO, Showtime, Cinemax. 
and stars. So in that era, they were looking to see how how ex- explicit they could be and still keep the ratings, still keep the money coming in. So in Living Color was the perfect platform. So uh, I found an article from HollywoodReporter.com. It is archived uh, from 2019. So I wanted to kind of give you guys a heads up, go out there again and check out uh, Good Grief with uh, Marlon Wayans as well. So this one is the Hollywood Reporter. This article was written by Mara Reinstein. And it's dated for June 21st, uh, 2019. So it says, Keenan Ivory Waynes wasn't looking uh, to do a TV show. In 1988, he was riding high on the success of his cult hit, I'm Gonna Get You Sucker, and contemplated uh, his next movie. Uh, but he took a meeting uh, with Fox and they made him an offer basically that he could refuse. Uh, they told me I could do whatever I wanted. Wayne's uh, 61 recalls what he wanted was to do a show uh, like Saturday Night Live, but more edgier. And so with that being said, uh, Homie the Clown, uh, Homeboy Shopping Network, as well as Men on Films, uh, the skits Wayne's and his mostly African-American cast perform each week push the envelope, uh, not just on TV's color barrier, but on TV comedy. Uh, won an Emmy, uh, an incubated the careers of stars like Jim Carrey, uh, Jamie Foxx, and Jennifer Lopez. Today, 25 years after its final episode, uh, May 19th, uh, 1994, I was actually a junior uh, in high school. Uh, the Hollywood Reporter tracks down the cast and crew for an oral history of a button-pushing uh, TV landmark. And then uh, this says, we were warped out of our minds in Living Color Stars Recall uh, Fox censors, uh, Spike Lee's disdain, and then in dishy oral history. So that's in a nutshell what that is. And so it says to continue the meeting, uh, he thought we were going to pitch him a black sitcom. Garth Acer, Fox Entertainment president, states, I kept in, uh, index cards of promising ideas on a cork board behind my head. Uh, one card just said black laughing. And so we needed someone to bring it to life. Now, Laugh-In was also, back in the 70s, there was a variety show called Laugh-In. Now, it started the careers of Cara Burnett, uh, Flip Wilson, also uh, Lily Tomlin, uh, just, uh, oh my gosh, so many others. Uh, Richard Pryor was on there. Just a lot of the stand-up slackstick comedy of the 70s was called Laughing. And I remember that because they had this board. And the board, every five seconds, the board board part would open and it would be a comic that would come out and say something raunchy or whatever. So back then in the 70s, it was Laughing. In the 80s, it was uh, Saturday Night Live. And then now it was In Living Color. So Kenny Ivy Wayne's uh, cast member and creator, I had done a movie called I'm Gonna Get You Sucker. And it was a big success. And I had set up screenings of the movie for all the studio film departments. But Fox didn't come. Uh, instead, they sent the TV execs. And so when I got a call, I thought I was going in to meet with the film side of Fox and instead, and instead ended up uh, in a meeting with the network. Wow. So Acer says he thought I was going to pitch him a black sitcom because of the Cosby show. Uh, I said, no, no, no. We would love to pitch you this idea and buy a pilot if you're up for it. So Wayne said at the time, Fox wasn't even a network. Wow. They were a startup. It says, and I really didn't have interest in that because I wanted to pursue film. He says, but they said to me, you know, if you come here, you can pretty much do anything you wanted to do. And I said, well, let me think about it. And then I kind of sat and said, if I am given an opportunity like this, what would I do? And then he said, so I started to put together the show for the idea. And so Sean Wayne's was production assistant DJ and DJ cast member. He said, I was a teenager. Keenan was telling me uh, that he was working on something and might have something for me. He was always Superman to me. I've been watching my brother do some incredible shit uh, since I was five. 
that just shows you like when you when you go see good grief you can hear through Mar- Marlon's stand up the fact that he had a strong foundation in family and even though he came from two different parents who had two different religious beliefs dad was a muslim and believed in the muslim faith and mom was a baptist so that whole mix you know she wants christmas and he doesn't celebrate it so that whole mix he addresses that in the stand-up comedy he did a wonderful job in new york city to even go there and do that so this just shows the foundation of family that's very important to them and why they became so successful looking out for each other this is keenan ivy waynes comes back and says i remember using laugh in as the model during the pitch I liked it. Uh, I liked its quick pace. And of course, I was a huge fan of Saturday Night Live. The difference was shorter ske- sketches and more, char- more character driven. Uh, I emphasized the edge of the show was going to be different. Fox bought the pilot. Then I picked the cast and everyone wanted to be on it. Wow. Tamara Rawit, writer, producer. Okay, where's my article? <laughs> just kicked off my article no where's my article okay there it is okay so i actually came up with the title of in living color drafting it off of the fabled nbc tagline so david allen greer cast member says i did my audition with Susie iceman uh chris rock and martin lawrence we improv wow i never knew that martin lawrence auditioned for in living color okay so uh jim carrey who's a cast member he chimes in and says, I have known Damon uh, through the stand-up circuit and we were always kind of clocking each other. Uh, He kind of admired what I was doing on stage. And then he told me, hey, crazy man, what do you think about coming in to audition for this thing? Come and meet my brother. And then Tommy Davidson, who was also a cast member, chimed in. He said, when I landed in Living Color, I was a hot comic. Uh, A week before getting the job, I met with uh, Lauren Michaels uh, in his office in 1990 for a potential SNL spot. Uh, he lined it up for me and said, I don't want a black uh, comedian. He's Eddie Murphy was a mistake. I don't want a person that stands out. I was confused. I was born black. This is, there is not a zipper in my, in the back, back of this thing. A spokesperson for SNL replies, this account is without merit. Chris Rock, uh, Tim Meadows, and Ellen uh, Clickhorn were all hired uh, into the cast between 1990 and 1991. Okay, a little controversy, a little bit. Okay. Carrie Ann Abba, fly girl, who's a fly girl, she says, I got a call from my agent. They were looking for hip hop athletic dancers under five foot seven of diverse cultural backgrounds. I went in wearing black leggings, motorcycle boots, and a white lacy bra with a black leather jacket. I tossed my jacket to the side and walked to the center of the room, ready and eager. Keenan always said that I got the job the moment I walked in because my outfit was so bad. I had so much confidence. This is Keenan and I, we want to say this. He's like, we shot the pilot. We did men on films. The Homeboy Shopping Network and the Raft of Farrakhan, uh, based on Louis Farrakhan. Uh, we showed it to Fox and they got nervous. And Sear, by the time the pilot was finished in 1989, I had left. Peter Charnin took over. But I saw it and I know a lot of people at Fox were offended by it. I made my thoughts known to Fox Chief Barry Diller uh, that it was a valuable show and to go forward with it. Riot, Fox knew, chimes in, uh, Riot says, uh, Fox knew they had something special, but the execs were also concerned about potential pushback from the African-American community. Okay, so the pilot sat in a long-term parking for six months. I discreetly passed along a copy to journalist at Details Magazine. She loved it. Okay, got her edit- editors enthused about the pilot and asked in print why it hadn't been picked up. And I faxed the piece to the executive team at Fox and we got our pickup. Peter Charnin, Fox Entertainment president, chimes in. He says, look, the truth is that everyone who saw the pilot went crazy for it. And then we started showing it to advertisers. They went crazy for it. We knew this thing hit a nerve from the beginning. It was just widely funny. And network television had never done anything this pointed about race in America.
Okay, chimed in season one. Spike Lee hated the show. So <laughs> Davison chimes in. He says, Keaton gave us the mission statement to take the comedy as far as you can take it. He said, the reason why we have uh, you here is you're out of the box. So I'm going to take you out the box and across the yard. <laughs> Keenan Ivy Waynes chimes in again. We were doing something that people hadn't seen yet. Barry Diller called Peter Chernin and said, we couldn't do the Black Gay uh, parody of men on films. He was worried it was going to be offensive, blah, blah, blah. He says, then I called Barry and said, I understood. I understand your concern, but do me a favor. At least come to the rehearsal and see it on its feet. He said, okay. He came down, he watched the rehearsal and it was like a bomb went off in the studio audience. People were stomping their feet and clapping and laughing. Barry stood there watching. His face didn't move. But then he turned to me and said, okay. And he left. So we were able to do it. Wow. Carrie, Jim Carrey chimes in. Uh, we were warped out of our minds. <laughs> we presented several sketches that didn't make it on the air. Uh, things that were just too insane, like the abortion rally. Uh, we came up with the sketch called Make a Death Wish Foundation about a dead kid whose uh, wish was to go to an amusement park that did not make it on the air either. But I came up with the face of the kid and it eventually turned into the fire marshal bill face. Wow. Kelly, Kelly Caulfield Park, uh, cast member, she chimes in. She says, David and I shot black and white spoof of Kelvin Klein commercial obsession, and we called it oppression. <laughs> he looked like a slave in bondage. We shot it for the pilot, but it took a minute for it to be on the air. Greer, Spike Lee hated the show. <laughs> He got really mad at us because he thought we were over the top about do the right thing. Uh, he did not like us making fun of him. People would get angry when we poked fun at them. Arsenio Hall too. Anybody that we really poked fun at. And then season two, season two. Okay, it wasn't easy getting this shit on the air. He says, uh, Les Firestein, writer and producer, he chimes in and says, I came on staff during the summer of 1990. The show was fired. He said, we had a shitload of work and there were enormous demands and not a lot of sleep. I assumed all the show business was like that. And then Sean Wayne chimes in again. We were hot. Everybody in the industry will pop up on our set from Easy e to Bruce Willis to Demi Moore. Sinbad, uh, Sinead O'Connor came by. They just wanted to tell everybody what a wonderful show it was. Anaba chimed in. There was a magic in the skits and the Fly Girls had this cult following choreographer. Rosie Perez pushed us hard. Uh, she didn't know how to pr pronounce uh, words like puree but it didn't uh pure pure wet and didn't matter and she had a vision uh and jennifer hudson <laughs> jennifer lopez all knew she was destined for greatness she was a very determined young woman Chernin chimes in again he says with a show like this you're looking to push buttons and this show pushed further than any show ever in the history of network tv sean wayne said but it wasn't easy getting the shit on the air and then Keenan Ivory Wayne chimes in. He said, I didn't have an uh, antagonistic relationship with the censors. I wasn't uh, irrational. I knew there was uh, there were restrictions. It was more about how far can I go? Like, just tell me where the line is. The frustration was that the line was moved week to week. So you could do something one week, but they got mail and, and you couldn't do it next week. We were constantly in a dance. Firestein uh, chimes in and says, we put decoy sketches in the script packs uh, to give it to the Fox execs. Uh, we did a men on film sketch about a male celebrity hanging out with Tom and Jerry at the a Cannons uh, Film Festival because there was a rumor about the uh, Gerbil up his, up his butt. <laughs> we got a very irate note, which I still have to uh, somewhere. But it uh, preoccupied the censor enough for us to do other stuff. So Grid chimes in and says, for the Headleys, hey, hey, Mon, we put 
in all those profane Jamaican curse words why people didn't know uh, what we were saying. Keenan Ivy Waynes uh, chimes in again. He says, there was a white censor uh, then Fox brought uh, in a black guy uh, that introduced to me as someone who marched in the civil rights movement. I was just like, he is not the president of the black race. I wouldn't deal with him. Uh, Churning, from a creative standpoint, he chimes in and says, I wanted the show to be as outrageous as possible, but we have an FCC license and we had advertisers and didn't want to get in trouble. I think we did a highly, highly responsible job in that sense. Okay, season three, they wanted the controversy. So who chimes in? Larry uh, Wilmore, writer. Uh, I came in on the third season. Before that, people would ask, what do you do? I'd say I was a stand-up comedy uh, comedian. Oh, that's interesting. But when I said I write for In Living Color, oh my God, they would lose their minds. Keenan Ivy Wayne chimes in and says, we decided to do a live episode during halftime of the Super Bowl in 1992. This was televised on CBS. So Greer says, chimes in, uh, we hijacked it. Before In Living Color, uh, they were doing uh, ribbon dancers and a white Christian scene group at the Super Bowl. So Keita Ivan Wayne chimes in and says, before we did our halftime special, it was just marching bands. That was the time during the game when everybody went to pee. <laughs> but after our special, the next year, they, they hired Michael Jackson. Oh my goodness. Wilmore chimes in and says, I wrote the man on the football uh, sketch. There were so many sexual innuendos just built in. He says, we got, <laughs> but we got a lot of support from the gay community. Wow. People love those characters. Damon and David had so much fun playing them. They were enjoying it so much that they were, that they were, that there was something infectious about it. But the network was very concerned because it was live. Keenan Ivy Wayne chimes in and says, there was a Fox executive in the booth with a 60 second delay button. They could have hit that button anytime they wanted, but they wanted the controversy. They wanted the controversy. This is crazy. And see, this is what it is. Oh my goodness. Go out there and I can't stress this enough. Go see good grief. Because then you understand the foundation of family that the Waynes have accomplished over the years. He even, Marlon even gets sentimental to the point of crying because you have to understand, we see these TV shows, we don't understand the magnitude of what goes through, what people go through to get to where they are. And so now with the success of the Wayans brothers, they get to come back and bring that success home to their parents and their family. So when the show opens, the stand-up show opens, Marlon is talking about his parents aging and how sentimental is that when he's on stage and he's literally crying. He's crying because he misses his mom. He misses his dad. The coolest thing is that in the opening, he actually uh, has his mom's voice coming over the airways, giving him encouragement as he goes after his dreams. It is just a, uh, it will tug at your heartstrings and it makes you want to just go back and watch and live in color all over again. That's what this does. And that's what a stand up show does as well. So this is season four. I showed up in dark sunglasses. Okay. So this Abba that chimes in, she says, uh, it's, Ch uh, Abba chimes in. She says, I left after three years. It was time. It says a dancer's career is short. Davidson, Tommy Davidson chimes in and says, other cast members like Jamie Foxx came in. They did a great job, but the chemistry wasn't as good as it was with the original cast. I noticed that. I really did. New people coming in. You have a um, brotherhood, sisterhood. You guys get up. You see, you see each other every day. And now all of a sudden, you have this whole new crew coming. So Carrie comes in and says, he chimes in and says, uh, there was a lot of love for the first few years, but then people start to fear what the next step is. So is, where am I going from here? Things uh, get a little tight. Wilmore chimes in. Keenan was the kind of boss 
who you really wanted to please, but was not easy to please. I used to call him Murphy Brown because he had a new assistant every week. Carrie chimes in and says, there were a couple of moments where I got pissed at Keenan and I would show up in a sketch with dark sunglasses on, uh, like screw you, man. Then everybody would get pissed at me and they'd show up in my sketch wearing dark sunglasses. <laughs> now I want to go back and take a look at all the scripts, all the show uh, episodes that uh, was a part of Jim Carrey's characters and then watch and see who shows up in sunglasses. And then that's the question. That's why they did that because they were doing payback for what Jim Carrey did during rehearsal. That was, wow, okay, okay, okay. So that's, that was crazy. So uh, Firestein weighs in and says, it was a difficult workplace for a lot of people. One of the reasons for that is uh, you had this very tight knit family that was at the center of everything, but the rest of us were not necessarily a part of that. If you weren't a Wayne's, you definitely had dues to pay. Wow. Keenan Ivory Wayne uh, chimes in and says, what started to happen into the fourth season was that it, it was business. Fox started uh, to rerun the show before it got into syndication. They were using the show to launch other shows and they were devaluing it. I felt like they were exploiting me. So I left in the middle of the season. Wow. So I'm going to do another part of this, part five. We're going to actually keep up in another video. I'm going to actually pause it. Well, I can do, I can do season five. Come on, let's, let's just keep going. Okay. So we were on the Titanic. So this is season five. Fine. Uh, Firestein after Keenan and Damon left, people at Fox told us to stop communicating with them. I think he had Stockholm syndrome. So Carrie said, chimes in and says, I was contracted for five years. I could have weaseled out, but I wanted to stick with it. Things were happening for me. I spent nights in my office with Steve O writing uh, the Ace Ventura Peg Detective script. We'd stay up until four in the morning and David Allen Greer used to rub it in during tapings. He'd go out to the audience and say, I don't know if you people realize it, but Jim Carrey is about to jump off in a movie called Ace Ventura Peg Detective. He meant it uh, factually. Uh, he was making fun of me for the silly name of the movie. Jealousy. Sounds like it to me. Allegedly jealous. So Sean Wayne weighs in and says, Kim Waynes, I and I were contractually obligated to their uh, last season. It was held. Uh, he said, I knew we were on the Titanic without the captain. And the iceberg was up ahead and I was shackled to the banister. Not one skit would work without Keenan's touch. Wow. Keenan Ivy Wayne chimed in and said, they didn't understand that the show was a vision. And once you remove the visionary, you just have a scripted show, a sketch show. He says, Firestein, uh, when we were canceled in 1994, I believe we were a bigger hit in the ratings than Seinfeld. My feeling is that the reruns prematurely aged the series. Also, I believe there was an ethic cleansing at Fox. They were trying to become more mainstream. Uh, they started canceling African-American centric shows like South Central and Rock. Uh, Channon Chernin chimes in and says, "This there's an old Fred Silverman quote, the least expensive programming, the least objectable programming. The Fox Network represented the transition to the media world we live in now, which is to try to identify valuable niches. In Living Color was a big part of that transition. Wilmore chimes in and says, it would be hard to bring the show back now. People are too sensitive. They had to bleep words from that All in the Family reboot episode. Sean Wayne's uh, chimes in and says, we had African-Americans, Asians, females. We brought gay characters into the living room in a fun way. It was all funny and fresh. Look at the diversity in TV today. We had it all in one episode. Carrie chimes in and says, it's a weird atmosphere. 
for comedy these days. There are too many lawyers in the world. Keenan Ivy Waynes chimes in and says, my siblings and I talk about the show all the time. Like all the people who could be making fun, who, who we could be making fun of, but we'd be off the air in a week. Hollywood is so reactive now. Let me tell you, let me tell you, this just goes back to show that diversity in comedy is alive and well. I still go back to the same thing. Go out there and support uh, Good Grief with Marley Waynes. He did a fantastic job uh, in New York, which is a very hard crowd. He got through it. And if you're looking for dark comedy, that's the one to go for. The actual network that it's on, let me pull that information up. And also, too, um, I really wanted to just discuss also the, the diversity in his acting because he was in actual respect. I'm sorry. He was in actual respect the movie Respect that starred Jennifer Hudson and he played Jennifer Hudson's love interest. And so as a result of that, I, he did say in his bio that he is good friends with Mike Epps. Well, you know, Mike Epps played a serious role in Sparkle. Uh, and so with that being said, a lot of our comics are transitioning into serious roles and it's awesome. He did an awesome job in Respect as Jennifer Hudson's love interest, Marlon Wayans did. And so go out there and support everybody's arena in entertainment. Tell me what you think in the comments. Do you think that he should stay in comedy? They should bring in Living Color back? Or he should just go on and stay on the uh, field of stand-up comedy? I really and truly enjoyed his project. It was just amazing. Go out there in the comments. Let me know what your favorite uh, In Living Color episode or memory is. Down below, let's start talking. Let's start communicating about comedy. Do we want... You guys are the... Look, corporations do focus groups all the time. So please recognize that my, my platform can be the focus group. If you think of a show, if you would like In Living Color to come back, leave the comments down below. Who knows? Some corporation may decide to read it. But we don't know how you feel if you don't put anything in the comment section of my videos and go from the history of my videos all the way up until now and comment over everything. You guys are the focus group and we need that communication to let the algorithm pick up. And, and then that way, um, YouTube will know that what I'm doing is of value. So help me out. Like, share, and subscribe and comment on everything that you're seeing from me today. Go out there and support Good Grief. It is on networks everywhere. Give me one second. I'm going to actually look up the network that it was on. I want to say Prime Video, but then I also, it's Prime Video because Amazon had the concert of uh, K-Dot, who is Kendrick Lamar, the whole battle with that. I saw that too. That's in a whole nother video. That video, uh, Not Like Us, he did that for like six times. He rapped that six times, not like us, in Los Angeles. And he got everybody to come together. The highlight of that, Kendrick, K-Dot, was the fact that he had Dr. Dre. Yes, honey, Dr. Dre brought some bars. He was ready to go before everybody and give those bars. Because what? I see. Oh my gosh, allegedly. Oh my gosh. Go out there and support everybody's arena of entertainment. Please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe on everything that you're seeing. Again, you guys are the focus group. We can't tell corporate America how to change if you guys are not going down below the video and making comments on everything that you're seeing. Music, entertainment, anything that I have ever covered, please go down below. You guys are the focus group. I want you guys to give us your input on everything that you're seeing from me today go out there and support everybody's arena of entertainment i am still looking i want to say prime video is the one that's carrying this this uh project by uh by marlon waynes actually it got a on the whole tomato rating it got 6.0 out of 10 
rating on the I am I'm on the IMDB website right now prime video is prime video you guys I got the two programs mixed up I watched some of everything so you get the Marlon Wayne's good grief on prime video and you get the K dot concert on Amazon so go out there and support everybody's arena entertainment I hope you guys got something uh, educational and informative about my video today and remember ladies if you are a part of the curve nation are we little girls hell no do we tap on doors hell no if you are a part of the curve nation ladies remember to kick that bitch off the hinges love you guys take care